Taiwan in the medium term is very simple. We all sign on to the one China policy, which basically means that Taiwan and Beijing have got to work out their arrangements. We do not play games which look like encouraging sovereignty. So, for example, having the Speaker of the House go to Taiwan from a diplomatic protocol standpoint is dancing close to the third rail because uh, constitutionally, uh, that's the number three in line to the presidency. So that that gets the Chinese all upset. And it's a, the United States is playing coy, saying, well, of course, we're not quite crossing the third rail, but we're letting you know we could. We don't play those games. The Chinese are not going to invade Taiwan if they think that it will eventually fall into their laps like uh, ripe fruit. So we continue to maintain low-key relations with Taiwan. We continue to send them a certain amount of armaments. Uh, but we, we basically maintain the status quo. What we should be doing militarily is figuring out how to shoot down uh, hypersonic missiles and dr- how to defeat drone swarms, how to deal with, you know, 50 ballistic missiles coming at a carrier. And maybe we abandon the carrier, do something else. The problem I have is that, you know, when when Bridge Colby and other people worry about how many 150 millimeter shells we have to send Taiwan because of all the stuff we've given to Ukraine, I think that's just the wrong way to think about it entirely. You can't defend Taiwan with conventional military technology. What's the next generation of military technology that we should be using? How do we defeat Drone swarms. How do we defeat hypersonics? It's the parallel. You know, the, the global war on terror created the the energy behind the creation of something like Iron Dome, which was different than anything that come before. And like, there's an equivalent of that for Taiwan that is not at all relatable to existing military technology. We used to spend more than one percent of GDP. That's not like two and a quarter trillion a year on the federal development budget. That means like building prototypes. Now it's a quarter of a percent. That's the problem. I'm an old Reagan hawk. Uh, I believe in peace through strength. The problem we've got now is provocation from weakness. Yeah. So we just, and I, I wrote a piece for Law and Liberties entitled Two Kinds of Detente. And I said, Nixon was right to pursue detente in the early 1970s because we couldn't win a war against, with the Russians in the Central Front. They were too powerful. So the right thing to do was pull back, uh, stall for time, and build new kinds of weapons. That's what we did. We invented the digital age in weaponry, smart weapons, uh, new, the modern avionics, all these things came out of the 1970s and 1980s, and then we won the Cold War. I want to be military, militarily stronger than China, but I think a lot of what comes out of Washington is braggadocio from a military establishment that's been building the wrong kinds of weapons to fight a China that existed 20 years ago and is covering a that's my that that's my reading of the quality of the debate. One of the things that people bring up time and time again when they're trying to say that there there's threat inflation with regards to China is that their military is completely untested in in a conventional warfare environment. Do you think that that matters? Is uh, are are all of their guns going to make a whoopee cushion sound the second they're shot on a well, battlefield? <laughs> What's going to well, happen? That, that's that's a very difficult question. Uh, the Chinese, the People's Liberation Army, is like this character from a horror movie with a gigantic head and a you know, spindly, tiny little body. The PLA, as a land army, is one of the worst trained, worst equipped armies <laughs> in the world. It's a joke. Uh, the PLA spends, uh, last I checked, I think $1,800 to equip a soldier. We spent about 20000 Now, What's $1,800? It's a rifle, a helmet, and a pair of boots change a uniform. Um, we also value each each individual soldier much more highly. Well, true, but you know the Chinese don't seem to have done anything 
with their land army. They have a mediocre tank. They're, they just don't have very much. Uh, they don't even have any ground attack aircraft. But the Chinese have a pure interceptor. We have built a pure interceptor since the Starfighter, I think, uh, in, the, in the 1950s. Uh, it has no cannon. It's only there to stop, to defend the Chinese coast. And they've got a thousand fourth and fifth generation planes. How good they are, we really don't know because we haven't fought them. I hope we don't find out how good they are. Uh, but we know that their missiles are extensive and they're very good. And they've got plenty of um, diesel electric subs, which make about as much noise as turning a light bulb on. So... Their capacity to defend their coast should not be underestimated. The rest of their army is backward, and that's a good thing, because since they haven't built up much, by the way, of land forces, they don't have much sea lift capability, uh, it does not look like they're planning to invade anyone. They've got, uh, th I think, uh, total 30,000 Marines. Last I, last I checked from the Pentagon sources. What do we have, including reserves, 180,000? They have 12,000 special forces. We have 75,000 special forces. So Chinese have not been putting money into the kind of things that would be the spearhead of foreign intervention. Not according to any source, including the Pentagon, that I've seen. They have invested massively in coastal defense, including electronic warfare, satellites, the whole kill chain. And that I would not underestimate. What's stopping them from um, blockading Taiwan now? I mean, is it primarily uh, just knowing where, you know, President Biden stands on well, Taiwan or? Well, there would be terrible consequences <clears throat> if they blockaded Taiwan. We would blockade them. We might cut off their oil, then they cut off oil to Japan. Or Taiwan, I mean, it, it, or or Korea, this could escalate very nastily and be terrible for everybody. And one thing the Communist Party of China wants to do is keep its people prosperous, and this would cause a depression in China, probably in the whole world. So the price they would pay for taking any kind of military action against Taiwan, and they have blockaded it for a day or so by running exercises, which are effectively a overnight blockade, but no real blockade, uh, we'd make them pay a price, even though it would cost us, it would hurt everybody. So unless they feel they have to, I don't believe they'll want to pay that price. And the critical issue is uh, t uh, Taiwanese sovereignty. Can they maintain the fig leaf that Taiwan is always going to be part of China, that sovereignty isn't an issue? Uh, the trick for everybody is simply to leave that off the table and let us do what Reagan and, in fact, Jimmy Carter before him did, rebuild our military technology. I know that you have your uh, preferred scenario as it relates to Taiwan, but what do you think is the most likely outcome over the next decade or so? Well, there's uh, a terrific book published a couple of years ago by Admiral Stavridis called 2034, about a nuclear war that erupts over Taiwan. Nobody wins. The Indians end up mediating between the United States and China after we each destroy a number of each other's cities. So that could certainly happen. <laughs> God forbid. And it's something to worry about. Uh, the most likely scenario is that we all back off because when it comes down to it, if the Chinese are not poised to invade Taiwan, and I don't believe they would unless they felt we were about to push independence, um, there's no reason for us to take provocative action. We can both back off. It's not like Athens and Sparta. I mean, Graham Allison did write a, good, a useful book, the, the Thucydides Trap. But remember, Sparta was terrified the Athenians would send aid to their helots, the slaves who supported them. And the Athenians were terrified the Spartans would aid rebels in the Delian League, which was supporting them financially. It was very easy for either Athens or Sparta to hurt the other 
in a very serious way. Much harder for the Chinese and us to hurt each other. So I'm, I'm less I, I'm less convinced by the Peloponnesian War examples than uh, some of my colleagues.